Won't you please be seated? Thank you. Becky and Tim, thank you so much for leading our worship and good morning, church. Great to see you this morning. I'd imagine, like so many of you last night, um, I picked up the news of an expected attack um, from Iran towards Israel. And we picked up the news this morning of what had happened. And it feels right that we just spend a moment praying for the situation in the Middle East. Just ask for God to intervene. So would you please join me in prayer? Father, as we have seen the situation in the Middle East and most of our lives, we, we've known conflict in that area of the world. And again, uh, just these last few months, we've seen just how much uh, this has cost in terms of human lives, in, in terms of destruction. And again, last night, we saw um, just how unstable the Middle East is, Lord. We come to you this morning to pray for your intervention and to pray that some level of peace would be restored again. So pray for world leaders, pray for those who are making the decisions that affect the lives of so, so many people, Lord. And as we pray for that part of the world, thank you that we have the assurance that one day you are the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. You will establish a kingdom where there will be peace forever. But until that day, Lord, we pray. We pray for wisdom and guidance for the leaders of our world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In my mid-twenties, um, I was part of a group that helped uh, what was called the CARE program at the YMCA in Cape Town. Um, in those days, the YMCA in Cape Town was a through and through Christian organization. And one of the things that this group did was to organize weekends for young guys who, for all kinds of reasons, um, had kind of gone off the rails, were trying to put their lives together again. And, and so we, we tried to invest some of our time in their lives. And, and I really have got some good memories of those weekends. Um, and one of the hikes that certainly has stayed in my mind ever since, uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, we started climbing Table Mountain uh, on a Saturday morning. It was glorious weather, really a great day. Um, the sun was shining. It was a nice warm day. Um, everyone was pumped up for what was going to be a three, four hour hike, really looking forward to it. But within the first hour or so, um, the cloud that sometimes rolls over the mountain made its appearance. And what had started as a very enjoyable journey, very enjoyable hike, became a bit of a nightmare. And for the next seven hours, we struggled to find our way out. We were wet, we were cold, we were lost. Um, we could barely see a couple of meters in front of us, very aware of the massive drops uh, on the mountain face. And it felt as if we would never come to the end of this journey. And after having spent what really felt like an eternity, we began to descend on the, other, on the other side of Table Mountain. And suddenly, coming out of the rolling clouds, we began to see what to me was one of the most beautiful sunsets that I've ever seen in my life. And the image that you have up on the screen really does not justice to what we saw. Um, the group simply stood there just hardly talking to each other. It was sheer beauty that we saw in front of us. And the previous seven, years, seven hours kind of got forgotten. And suddenly, all that didn't seem to be that important. We had this massive, beautiful sunset of ours. We were coming down to the beach. We had to set up camp, and it was going to be great. We had a new perspective that changed what we had been experiencing up until then. In the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament... We find an account of a change of perspective as well. As we know, we are doing this series called Alive. It's a series um, looking at how the risen Christ impacted the lives of those who saw it and experienced it. Last Sunday, we began to look at the well-known character of Mary Magdalene. And this morning, we're going to look at another account, which is a well-known account to so many of us. It's found in Luke chapter 24. 
And rather than, than having the reading up on the screen as we normally do, I'm just going to go through some of the verses this morning. So, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now, that same day, and what day was that? Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Day. Now, on that same day, two of them. It's interesting that not much more is said about it. The text is telling us that they are two people. But who are they? And how do they fit into the account of Jesus' life? Now, some scholars believe that these were two men who had been um, to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. They were now returning home to their village. Other scholars uh, believe that this is a couple who had also been to Jerusalem, and they are now returning home. And, and the answer to this question is really very uncertain. There's no way that we will ever be able to be 100% certain. Uh, but it really, in some ways, is not that important. And, and probably one of, the ways, one of the reasons why we're not kind of accustomed as to who these people are is because we often refer them merely as the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. But there is some evidence in the Bible, in the gospel, that may just help us to get a slightly clearer picture of who these people may have been. For one thing, the story itself gives us the name of one of them. In the passage that we're studying this morning, and we'll get to it just now, Luke tells us that one of the disciples was called Cleopas. Now, there is another mention of this name in another one of the Gospels. That's John. In John 19, 25, we read this. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, it is true that John spells the name slightly differently, but the spelling of names was often varied in antiquity, and never mind antiquity. Sometimes when I write an email and I read through it, the only question I can ask myself, even with spell check, how on earth did I manage to make so many mistakes? Now, many scholars believe that these two names refer to the same person, uh, but there's more to it. From what John is saying, Mary Magdalene is there, and we looked at the story last week. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there at the crucifixion. And there was somebody else there, Mary, who was the wife of Clopas, who was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Which means that if this were to be true, then this couple that are walking on the road to Emmanuel were a family of Jesus. Now, I wouldn't create a doctrine based on this. And I certainly wouldn't want to say that with absolute certainty that this, the couple that we find here are family of Jesus. But it is an interesting idea that some of the scholars have been developing over a period of time. So, okay, back to the passage. Now, that same day, Resurrection Sunday... Two of them, who may or may not have been family of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. It's a short trip. It's only seven miles, but one that would take, give or take, about an hour and a half at a normal pace. And as they were walking together um, on this journey, they were talking to one another when a stranger appears behind them listening to their conversation. Verse 14. They were talking with each other and everything that had happened, and this is referring to the weekend, the Passover weekend, and the crucifixion in Jerusalem. As they talked and discussed these things with, one, with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, Jesus, Luke tells us that Jesus himself gets close to them, and asks what seems to be a very normal question. Um, as this couple are discussing, they seem to be so engrossed in their conversation. Uh, they kind of stop and listen to Jesus. Verse 17, they stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them, called Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have happened 
in these last few days. So what conversation are we having? Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been going on in the last few days? Where in the world have you been? Now, Jesus did not answer the specific or the implied question directly. But he had answered the, if he had answered the question, I wonder if you'd say something like this. So the first question is, did you know, do you know what's happening in Jerusalem? Probably you could have said, I am the only person on earth who actually fully understands every single thing that happened in the last few days. Had Jesus answered the implied question, where on earth have you been? Maybe he could have said, well, let me start on Thursday night. I, I was with some friends. We were celebrating Passover together. And after that, I went to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. And I prayed so intently that I was sweating drops of blood, begging my father concerning the mission that he had set before me. And when that prayer was finished, I went across the Kildren Valley. There in the darkness of the night, I was arrested by a group of soldiers carrying torches and swords and led by a former friend who had betrayed me. Then the soldiers took me to the city and they shuttled me between, for, uh, shuttled me between the Jewish and the Roman authority to and from until I was finally put on trial before the Roman governor. After my interrogation, those were standing by, he said to those who were standing by, I find no fault in this man. And he was about to release me, but the screaming crowd kept on crying for my blood. They kept on shouting, crucify him. And being a politician wanting to be popular, Pilate gave in to the voices of the crowd. He had me brutally beaten, crowned with a crown of thorns, and led me out, and then led me out of the city of Jerusalem to a barren hillside called Golgotha, where I was executed by crucifixion. But that is not all. I wasn't simply executed as a criminal to satisfy bloodthirsty men. There I was subject to the absolute wrath of God, where before his face I was forgotten and forsaken. He placed upon me the judgment of every single person, something that no other human could ever do. Finally, it ended. I was finished. I committed my spirit to the care of my father, and I died. Then they took me down from the cross, and somebody interceded on my behalf. Rather than my body being thrown into the pit outside the city where the, the rubbish is burnt, I was entrusted, my body was entrusted into the hands of a secret disciple called Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man who owned a very beautiful, marvelous tomb in which I was entombed. This happened so that prophecies that had been made hundreds of years before, where God promised that his servant would not suffer corruption. They took my dead body, they wrapped it in grave clothes, anointed me with spices, and then posted guards in front of the cave, also guarded by a huge stone rolled in front of it. Then early this morning, a cosmic burst of power returned my soul to my body. My heart began to beat and pulsate with blood driving through my veins and arteries, and I opened my eyes. I was back from the grave. Angels came and rolled the stone away. And I walked out into the dawn alive. That's what I've been doing for the last three days. But that's not what Jesus said. Luke's record, however, paints a very different picture. This is what Jesus said. What things have you been talking about? Well, they reply, we've been talking about, verse 19, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, he was a prophet. Powerful in word and dead before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. 
They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And after hearing them sharing this with Jesus, Jesus replies in what seems to be a bit of a rebuke. Verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now I need to explain the meaning of the word foolish used here. Jesus is not calling them stupid. He's not saying that they were not intelligent or they were uneducated. In Jewish culture, and certainly the term that's used here, uh, this term refers more to not somebody who has got low intelligence, not somebody who has um, low intellect, but it this is a moral judgment more than anything else. And then Jesus gives them a master class in Jewish history and the Old Testament. And begins maybe with Moses, and we don't know, the text doesn't tell us where Jesus began to share as he talks about Moses. But I would imagine it would be early when God pronounced the curse upon the serpent, saying that the seed of the woman would crush this, the head of the serpent, and while the seed of the serpent would bruise his heel, which we had seen in the crucifixion. Surely he mentioned the covenant with Moab and the covenant with Abraham. And now in Genesis 15, Abram is described as, as being righteous because he believed in God. And then maybe Jesus continued to tell the disciples about Jacob and his sons Joseph and the migration to, to Egypt, the enslavement of the Jewish, uh, the Hebrew people in Egypt, and then the appearance of Moses as a leader, and then Joshua and the promised lands, and David and Solomon and the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And Daniel, Ezekiel, the valley of the dry bones. Then Micah's short prophecy about this tiny village, which would be the exact location where the Messiah would be born. And from Genesis to Malachi, Jesus intellectually opened up the scriptures to this couple walking to Emmaus. Notice that Jesus said that all these things were necessary to happen. This was not an accident. Jesus had not betrayed Jesus by accident. It was not an accident that Jewish rulers um, had conspired to kill him. These things were ordained before the foundation of the world. They had to happen for the sake of humanity. Well, finally, the couple come to the end of the journey. Jesus was going to move on, but they persuade him to stay for supper. Verse 28 of the passage. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Then something happened that was to transform their lives completely. They saw a new perspective of their situation. Verse 30. When he was at the table with him, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and they disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? After this happened, the text simply tells us that they walked back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. Think about it for a moment. If they are in fact family of Jesus, and I cannot be certain of that, but let's think of that. They would not be young people, probably in their 50s, maybe touching their 60s. Okay? They had just walked seven miles. Now they're going to do the same journey back again. It's dark now. It's nighttime. It's an unsafe journey. They didn't say, that was quite amazing. It will be nice to tell the disciples next time we're in Jerusalem. And we make a point of just getting a chat with them. 
But for tonight, for tonight, well, it's, it's been a, a long day. Why don't we just have a drink and go to bed, and we can talk about it tomorrow. No, none of these things. They put their sandals back on, they locked the front door, and they went back walking to Jerusalem, to the place where their former grief and despair had disappeared. Luke says, at once they left. And like last Sunday, when I mentioned to you how Mary Magdalene's life was totally transformed after the resurrection, and she spent the rest of her life sharing the news about Jesus, that he's the promised Messiah. I can't tell you what happened to this couple after they met the risen Christ. Um, the text is silent. We've got no evidence of anything. But there's one word that says a lot that we find in the passage that I've just read to you. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road? Burning. This wasn't simply an intellectual conviction. What we find here is more than a simple engagement of the mind. The word there describes a visceral, highly emotional, deeply felt reaction. May I ask you a question? When was the last time <clears throat> you felt your heart burning within you for Jesus Christ? Yes, I know that just because we are Christians, life is not lived on the mountaintop every single day. So much of our time is spent in the valley. So much of our time is spent in the wilderness. But when was the last time that you had a mountaintop experience? When was the last time that you felt your heart burning because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that is so overwhelming in you? When was the last time that you felt your heart burning because once again you grasped the reality that you are worshiping the risen Christ? And once we encounter the living Christ, nothing is quite the same again. Because Jesus is alive, we have a story to tell. Because he's alive, everything the Gospels say is true. Because Jesus is alive, death itself is defeated. Because Jesus is alive, then heaven is more than just wishful thinking. And because he's alive, our sins are forgiven. And because Jesus is alive, all the promises that he's made are true. So when you think of this, when was the last time that you felt your heart burning within you as you worshipped the risen Christ? The passage were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us. In a moment, we are going to sing our closing song. The words we'll be singing tell us that Jesus is here, moving in our midst, working in this place, is here wanting to touch every heart, mend every heart. Is here healing every heart, turning lives around. He is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, light in the darkness. Our God, that's who he is. And so, let me ask you again for the last time. When was the last time that you felt your heart burning within you as you worshipped the risen Savior? Father, thank you that as we look at the cross, the empty tomb, there is nothing else in us that we can do but bow down before you and worship you. 
when the reality of the empty tomb becomes more than just an academic thought, it becomes part of who we are. Lord, our lives are so transformed, and I thank you for that. And yes, Father, there are moments when the life is just spent in the valleys and the wilderness. But I pray, help us to be the type of people, those who long for those mountaintop experiences where our hearts are burning within us because we know that Jesus Christ is alive. Pray for myself. Pray for each one of us here this morning, Lord. May that be our experience as we begin this week. In Jesus' name, amen.